The Stage Door Show. Celebrating the independent artist. With your host, Dave Hondell. Hi everybody, welcome to The Stage Door Show tonight. This is Dave Hondell. On tonight's show, we have an award-winning writer, producer, and director who has worked on some of TV's most iconic television shows. And we're happy to have him with us tonight. Please welcome to the show, Mr. Stan Zimmerman. Welcome, Stan. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much for being here. Um, now, you've written for some of TV's biggest shows, like I mentioned, you know, like the Golden Girls, Roseanne, Fame, Gilmore Girls, Brothers, and, and so many others. You know, how did you get started in the industry? What, what got that interest going for you? I started at a very young age, like seven, uh, in my bedroom uh, creating ideas for TV shows, actually. Um, I was so unpopular that I was, nobody would play with me. No, you don't need to have like the string quartet, you know, sad story. Um, but I created my own TV network in my bedroom. And I literally made a board and programmed seven days a week of programming against all the major networks. I know, pretty. Wow. I should have been taken to a therapist, but instead uh, I got taken to a theater camp and their Cranbrook Theater School in Bloomfield Hills, Michigan. And there uh, I started doing plays and um, I thought the plays were kind of corny because they were princes and kings and things like that. Yeah. So I started ad-libbing or doing different shticky stuff and I'd get laughs. Yeah. And, and the minute I heard laughs, I got very excited and I thought, this is what I need to do for my life. But I was not a reader, so I didn't think I could be a writer. And in English class, I didn't get the best grades. You know, I got like Bs, but... Um, I, I didn't write very flowery. I just kind of got to the point. And what's interesting years later, I learned that in writing for TV, especially sitcoms, you have to get right to the point because you got 22, 23 minutes. You got to get in and get out, you know, with, yeah. with jokes always leaving and entering rooms. Um, but I just always had this very vivid imagination. And um, luckily I met my writing partner, Jim Berg in NYU. I went there for acting not knowing I would meet somebody that I would still be writing with today. Now, growing up in Michigan as a child, I mean, did you ever dream that you were going to be where you are now? Of course. Yeah. I used to tell my little sister, uh, I was living in a mansion. I don't know if it's a mansion, <laughs> but it has high ceilings. And uh, But I said I would be in Hollywood. And I really always dreamed of what this world would like. Uh, for um, our 13th birthday, our bar mitzvahs, or bat mitzvahs, mm -hmm. uh, my parents said you could go anywhere in the world we'll take you to my brother picked israel where did i pick hollywood hollywood <laughs> i had to go to hollywood yes um and it was just the most exciting thing you know i'd ever seen and, and you know got to go to the brown derby and as we're walking out um someone dropped their pepper mill you know let you have sure. on your yeah. yeah yeah so my mother picked it up and handed it to the woman and i looked and the woman was ann miller the movie star wow like oh my god another. yeah so it was very exciting and i think we also chased another man down the street thinking it was woody allen but it was just an old jewish guy who was very nervous <laughs> it wasn't woody um, allen okay it wasn't woody allen and but uh, he probably wondered why this you know little kid was like chasing after him with his autograph book wow yeah, I can I can relate to that. I, I grew up uh, loving movies and TV, and and uh, I, I had my first uh, trip to Hollywood too, and it was a trip of a lifetime. So I can cl completely relate to you. Yeah, uh, I mean, I could go to like you know movies every night. I remember my yeah. father was kind of strict, and he said you could only go to one movie a weekend. And I'm <laughs> like, that is the dumbest rule in the world. Like, why couldn't I just you know live at a movie theater? And I guess he wanted me out playing sports, but that that was not going to happen. What was your favorite movie growing up? I have to say it's The Wizard of Oz. And I sure. didn't see it in a movie theater. I saw it as, um, you know, in my house. And it was only once a year because uh, we didn't have VCRs back then. Right, right. And when my parents got a dog, they actually got a Karen Terrier. And, of course, we were so unimaginative, we named her Toto. Sure, of course. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, they told us that she was related to the Toto dog in the movie. And, of course, as a kid, you believe that. Mm -hmm. and then you go to school and you tell everybody that. How that dog somehow ended up in Detroit, Michigan, I don't know. But, <laughs> but she did, and we treated her like royalty. That's incredible. Um, you know, talking about movies, uh, Wizard of Oz, and to today... 
you know, obviously the, the business has really evolved, you know, from, from the TV shows way back when to, to now. So talk about that evolution and, and how does that change your writing? And, you know, do you always try to stay ahead of the curve knowing what's going on in pop, cult, pop culture? Or you just try to really, you know, I, I, have you ever sit in the writing room and, and, and think that you're actually creating pop culture, uh, you know, with the episode that you're working on? You have about 50 questions in that one question. <laughs> so I could, I could pick any road and go down there for sure. like a three hours and, you know, yeah, none, yeah. none of us will be eating for a while, but um, <laughs> it'll be longer than waiting for the election result. But um, I've always been a fan and a freak about pop culture. I would just obsess about news from Hollywood and I would cut out um, from the newspaper all the movies that were playing in town and I had a cork wall and I'd put them up and so I always wanted to know who, what actor was doing what and I remember my father went to New York and he brought me back a variety newspaper and I memorized everything in there. I knew every play, what theater was at, how much money that play made. Sure. Um, so I always loved pop culture and I, I feel like what my writing is about, it's very commercial and pop culture oriented but it always pushes the boundaries in some way. I don't purposely go to push the boundaries. It's just what I'm, I gravitate towards. Um, I'm very uh, sensitive and sympathetic about how people feel. So I think I just go towards, you know, I have just a, um, my heart just uh, is drawn to stories like that. And I want to tell, tell them. And, um, but when you're writing them, you don't think, oh, I'm going to write about pop culture when, you know, we, we're lucky enough to get on Golden Girls. I never thought, you know, years later, I would be on a Golden Girls fan cruise with, you know, over a thousand fans, which I was at the beginning of this year, pre-COVID. Wow. Um, I was on two back-to-back -back, um, and met just the most wonderful people, you know, men, women of all ages, um, and they've become friends. And it's been really a wonderful part of writing on shows like that and it's just funny because people will come up and say i don't mean to bother you i just can i tell you this and i'm like are you kidding because writers don't get that you know yeah. actors get people coming up to them and talking about sure projects that they're in because they know their faces and a little more now you know because of shows like yours or just being with sure. social media um but i love to hear you know what people think of you know certain lines or um, and I'll go into these, you know, uh, like Golden Girl fan groups on Facebook and they'll post little memes of lines that I wrote, like, no, no, I will not have a nice day. And I'll say, oh, that's, thanks. That's my line. And they'll look, <laughs> what do you mean that's your line? Or that's incredible. People post a lot, you know, in the past four years, uh, Sure Jan from the Brady Bunch movies. Yeah. And that was something that we, you know, wrote and right. not knowing that it would end up being a meme, you know, yeah. for so many people. That's amazing. Uh, you know, and then also, um, you know, Roseanne, you were, you, you were part of that, uh, that crew as well. And, and when you're in a, a production like that, that, that ends up being such a, a legendary show and, you know, you were part of, um, you were nominated actually for, for one of the episodes, Don't Ask, Don't Tell. And, you know, back then, and like we talked about before, you know, cutting edge, you know, did you ever, when you're sitting in that room, do you ever think that what the episode that you're actually writing is going to have that big of an impact? Well, I mean, I knew that she was a touchstone and, and she really, you know, at that time with Tom Arnold, they were in the news a lot. I mean, they just, right. you know, walked down the street and suddenly they were on the news. I didn't have any idea that this subject of Roseanne kissing a woman would turn into a news event. I would literally would be writing it during the day. I'd come home, if I was lucky to come home at 11 o'clock, watch the news, and they would be talking about our episode on the news because at the time ABC said, you cannot film this episode. You, we're not airing it, you can't film it. And to the credit of Roseanne and Tom Arnold, they said, if you don't air it, we will buy it back, buy time on HBO and air it there. So they were like, okay. And then they tried to get us to cut down the kiss to like, you know, 2.3 seconds. And, um, and then Jim and I threw a big benefit for GLAAD, which is a gay and lesbian media organization not knowing if the scene was going to be in there. We didn't know because back then you just didn't know. And we had just CNN and everybody who came and they're filming it. We had hundreds of people there. We we're raising money for this group. 
and they kissed. And I just remember, you know, two, three hundred people in this huge disco just screaming because we'd never seen anything like that on TV before. Now it seems so like, really? It was all, you know, Cree Ellen and Will and Grace. And, you know, the cool thing is that being, you know, I couldn't have done that if it wasn't for Soap and other shows before what we did. Mm -hmm. And then see people stand on our shoulders to be able to, you know, do even bigger um, shows in that arena. That's amazing. You know, talking about writing, a lot of our uh, listeners are independent artists. Some of them are writers as well. But talk about that process because I think I don't think a lot of people realize that when when you're a writer for a show, you you often work with a team of writers, and it's not just one or two people. Am, am I right in that? Yes. Usually, it's you know it can be you know five ten people. On Roseanne, it was twenty one writers. Wow. So they brought in a lot of their stand-up comedy friends who had never written before, you know, like Norm MacDonald and Laura Keitlinger and Sid Youngers and Pat Bullard. And um, and they've all gone on to become writers. But at the time, they were just joke people. And so we would, you know, we had to uh, separate because there were so many people, you'd have different rooms. And Jim and I would run a room with some of those people like Norm MacDonald and talking to them. And Lois Bromfield was in the room. Um, about the jokes have to come from character. They can't just be a joke. Right. And especially with a show like Roseanne, it really wasn't like, you know, funny, ha ha. It was because they came from character. And I always thought, and I learned that, we learned it on Golden Girls, really character humor. And that's what makes things funny. If they're real to that specific character. Um, so, you know, that was a, a big group of people to kind of navigate. Um, now, you know, shows have much smaller staffs because just the economics of it. Uh, so, but it's great to be in a room with like really funny creative people. And if you get to run a show like we did with Rita Rocks on Lifetime, you get to pick, you know, the writers in the room and who you're hanging out with and laughing with and people you can count on to who are the real funny joke people? Who are good story people? Who's going to give me that perspective that I not would necessarily have? And that's you know, it's like creating a dinner party. Now, when you have so many creative people in the same room, do you ever do you ever butt heads? And and how do you? Oh no, never. <laughs> of course you do. How, how do you navigate? How do you navigate around that? Well, it's um, easier when you're a Libran like myself, who is is very much into compromising and sure. balance everybody sure. uh, but because I've written with somebody a writing partner since the beginning you know I always had in my mind that it's about compromising yeah. and finding that balance and so that cut that muscle was already in me um, I think at the beginning of my career I would be you know like the one that would raise my hand and go why are those characters talking and why are they friends and They'd be like, shut up. It's just they're friends because they're in the script. Like, don't think so much about it. So, you know, obviously I, I had a learning curve and, you know, you have to learn. Uh, you know, the biggest thing I learned was pick your battles. Sure. I think that's really in any business is you don't want to be that person to be like, no, 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 no. Like, you know, yeah. it, especially when you're writing on someone else's show, they are hiring you for your opinion, but you have to know when to back off and go, here's what I think. But if this is what you want to do, okay, how do I make what they want work? And right. then I get in that position, and it's my show, how do I explain to people what I would want? Right. You know, and also, you, you, you also do, do a lot of directing and producing in the theater as well. It's not just the TV and, and, and film, but as you can see your shirt. Um, Pop-Up Playhouse, your, your uh, theater company, and you've done a lot of productions and, and been, you know, a lot of awards have, have come from that. But talk about the difference between maybe writing, producing, and directing in the theater versus a TV show and, and film. I mean, obviously they're different uh, mediums, but uh, do, you, do you prefer one over the other working in that? Um, I, I, I got back into theater um, after doing Gilmore Girls and I did a reality show on um, Bravo called Situation Comedy that Sean Hayes of Will and Grace, Grace produced. And they asked me to direct this play and I just loved it. I was like, I was in heaven. And so I started directing more plays and then uh, Larry Hirshhorn, a big Broadway producer, I was having drinks with him in New York and he, he said, you're a writer, write the play. 
And I'm like, uh, well, who wants to, I'm not gonna write about myself, but I wrote about um, uh, the world that I live in. Sure. And so the, one of the first plays I created uh, was about actresses in an audition room at a network for a really bad sitcom. Oh. And uh, <laughs> called Meet and Great. And okay. I did that. And, um, then created another musical and both those I did with another writing partner, Christian McLaughlin, who worked on Married with Children. Uh, so I've always liked working with other people. I like being able to go back and forth and spitball with them. But we created a musical using TV theme songs, over 40 theme songs from I Love Lucy to Big Bang, you know, Cheers and right. Friends and Golden Girls, obviously. And so we're still working on that one. Sounds, it sounds great. Um, you know, talking about theater, and I was telling you before we started recording that we have friends on, on Broadway, and unfortunately, uh, a lot of young actors, struggling actors on Broadway and off-Broadway are unfortunately out of work right now. Um, it's dark until, uh, I believe, next summer. Um, so talk Theaters about, across yeah, the uh, world, everywhere. but, you know, you know, and I've been doing mostly small theater in L.A. We can't do theater now. Right. And I was really going more towards that in my career, I, I mean, I love television, I love movies. There's something about being in a theater with live people, especially a comedy. Sure. And I go to my plays when I direct them every night. And the actor's like, really, you're coming back? I'm like, why would I not want to be there hearing people, <laughs> you know, scream laughing after, you know, during your, your lines. So I really was liking that and, and the intimacy of the theater and also mixing art and advocacy with some of my theater projects of late. Right. And so that was kind of my goal and maybe thinking of moving back to New York and or having a certain project kind of getting me back to New York for you know three or four months and testing the waters and being back there. And I was actually back in New York in March um, working, workshopping a new play. And then COVID hit and we got one reading out and then I got back on a plane and came back here and I've literally been sitting here since March <laughs> yes, in the spot. <laughs> Well, you know, the difference between L.A. and New York, because that's something I wanted to explore also, because when you, when you have theater in, in L.A., is, is are the works in L.A. different than New York? I mean, do you have to kind of keep that in mind where you're going to workshop it and play it? Depending yeah, on I mean, L.A. has this, um, you know, oh, it's L.A. theater. And also, when I started in theater here, you know, over 10 years ago, it seemed very separate. There were the TV people, and then there were TV movie people and theater people. And I was like, why can't we all be together? Like, is it New York and London? So I kind of made it my goal to like knock down those barriers. And I really have seen that evolution change. It used to be in the beginning like, oh, you know, you're a TV person. And then now it's just like, we're all together doing it. And I wanted to create in LA spaces where anybody would feel welcome. It, you don't have to, if you're on a TV show, you don't have to work in the, this huge big theater. You could come to a play with me in a 50 seat theater. So I've been working with some amazing, wonderful people like Marissa Jared Winoker from Hairspray, a Tony Award winner. Yeah, she did yeah. her first play play, not a musical, with me in a 50 seat theater. And we just had the best time. Well, that's great. You know, what? what is your, in your career, what is the most memorable moment or you might have several, but what is your most right memorable? here with you? Oh, really? <laughs> well, that's great. Thank you, Stan. <laughs> that that's great because I, I, you know, I I need the 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 followers. I'm starting to really you know gain it, but this will really help, and I really appreciate you being on. Oh, right oh I'm sure. I'm sure with me, you're gonna you're gonna just burst out. Yeah, the, the right. old the old Jew influencer. <laughs> um, you know, I've had so many wonderful moments and. Yeah. That's why I just like, I kind of jump out of bed because I don't purposely move or shift. It's like where things kind of have evolved and where stories I want to tell. Right. So I keep pushing myself and, and Jim and I did that with our writing career too. Every time it kind of seemed there was a lull and sitcoms are dead. We got into writing movies and did the Brady Bunch movies and then we got back into sitcoms. And then we started, uh, we rewrote the Annie musical for uh, Zayn and Marin on ABC. And it was, you know, Kathy Bates and Kristen yep. Chenoweth and Ellen Cumming, and it was crazy cast. It was great. Um, so then we started getting into writing musicals and that that was really wonderful. And, you know, now getting into plays. And so just juggling all those things with stories and telling really, I love obviously telling comedy stories, but mm -hmm. then also like creating this piece right before I go 
um, using real suicide notes, which I created after a very close friend of mine died by suicide eight years ago. So I created a piece in kind of the model of vagina monologues where people mm. can read the notes with like a day rehearsal sitting at stools. Sure. But we just did a, um, a virtual recording of it uh, last month where I am now in the play. So it's a full circle moment. Nice. Uh, so originally I created it was just people reading all the notes. And um, then my director, Michael Wilson, suggested I put my story in it. So now the play is really about what happens to a funny comedy writer person when something tragic happens in their life. Sure. So. I'm there acting virtually with Vanessa Williams and Blair Underwood. And, you know, that was yeah. a pretty amazing experience to have and to figure out ways to still be creative during COVID. Yeah. And that's, that's one of the things, other thing I was going to ask you about COVID because everybody has. It's like, I knew, I knew you were going to ask that. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, I mean, the fact that you did like, you know, a Zoom, uh, I guess, performance, we've seen that a lot, I guess, during COVID. But, you know, I I've think done, if, I've done like one a month. I've oh, done a really? lot. Yeah. Okay. So mostly, mostly live, but I've been starting to record sure. uh, a, a few of them. Yes. Well, it allows you to be creative still. And how do you draw your creativity? I mean, what do you draw your inspiration from when you start writing? I mean, is it every day? events that happen that you notice and like oh coffee, that's a great idea. coffee and sugar-free red bull <laughs> so i would be a really good spokesperson for that um <laughs> you know it's just being alive and being having your antennas and uh when i started back at this cranbrook theater school when i was a kid luckily they told me at a seven and a half years old as an actor watch people and I just got that in my head. I watch and I look and I like think of what are they saying over there? I make up dialogue and right. sometimes my writing partners still do that. So it's just being inquisitive and listening and caring about other people and, and what's happening in the world. Sure. Well, what, if we, what advice would you give my listeners as independent artists um, as they embark on their career? What, what's the one piece of advice that you would, you would give them? And no matter what genre they're in, uh, one piece Just of keep going, keep creating. Um, I'm like, you know, those mazes, if you hit one thing, then figure out a way, know where you want to go, but then you're going to be hitting blocks and people telling you no, or you are telling yourself no for whatever reason, just keep figuring a way to get to that. And that's the wonderful thing about being an artist is that you can create, no one can tell you not to create, you know, whether if you're a painter, you can take out some, whatever you're going to paint with, or if you're a musician, you sit there and what am I going to? What song am I going to write or sing? If you're a, you know, a writer, you can turn on your computer and suddenly you have a creation. And then you find all, you know, like, you, or if it's a play, you find actors that want to read your words. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's got to be nothing better in the world to have something you've written down and having somebody perform it on the screen. That's got to be just a, a great role. Well, the, the first biggest thrill when I first really it hit me was on golden girls when i would be standing on the stage and i would look to the right and there'd be like those you know stands of the studio audience sure. of all ages screaming and laughing at your lines and i would look over there and there would be like four of the most talented women ever on television yeah. saying the lines and that was so super cool that um that's amazing just, that just you know makes me want to keep going or, or up to the thing I just did with Vanessa Williams. And there she is saying my lines. And I just am so blessed that I've gotten to work with so many wonderful people. How was it working with the Golden Girls? Uh, you know, the cast, like you said, they're amazing. Um, do you have, do you have like a funny story you can, you can check? Oh, I have plenty. <laughs> I'm saving some. I actually just signed a book deal. Oh, okay. <laughs> Indigo River. Uh, and it's called The Girls from Golden to Gilmore. And it's stories about all the wonderful women I've worked with and Roseanne. Um, <laughs> and it will be a tell-all, but a real Valentine to the women that uh, have been such an influence in my life and have shaped me as a writer, but more specifically as a person. Yeah, we can't wait till, till that comes out. Um, so what yeah, other- I can't wait till I write it. <laughs> uh, I'm talking to you. I should be sitting, you know. Writing. <laughs> yes. So what other projects do you have that we can look forward to? Uh, I'm about to do a recording, a virtual recording of a play I wrote called Yes, Virginia. 
uh, with Mindy Sterling from Austin Powers and Arnisha Walker. I love Mindy is, Sterling. Oh, uh, yeah. she is brilliant. Yeah. I've done I've done a bunch of plays with her, and if I don't cast her in a play, she gives me crap about it <laughs> in front of everybody. Yeah. Um, so it's a, a two character play. We were supposed to do it in North Carolina in December, but because of COVID, we're going to be recording it and. Um, I will be getting out the information so if people follow me on social media, they can see Mindy and Arnisha in this really wonderful, heartwarming, but really funny play um, based on my mother and my longtime African-American housekeeper in Detroit. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah. It takes place on Christmas Eve. Oh, so wow. It's a, it's a nice holiday piece, but it, it has the humor, but also the reality of like a Golden Girls episode. Sure, that's great. I can't wait for that. Um, you know, Stan, I, I just want to uh, tell everybody about your, your website as well. Zimmermanstan.com. And I love going through your, your website. I think it's very well done. Uh, just looking at your, your history, your bio, just growing up in Michigan. I'm, I'm a Midwesterner as well. I, I grew up in Minnesota. So, you know, I can kind oh, of relate Minnesota, to the cold nice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, that's why I think one of the, the things I liked about the Golden Girls was, was St. Olaf. And, you know, just hearing that, you know, as a kid, you kind of get proud of that. As Midwesterners, we get excited about stuff like that. <laughs> but uh, well, all of that, when we were in the first season, we kind of came up with all those stories. Like, oh, wow. The first season we... You know, in the pilot, she didn't always tell those long stories and just that kind of evolved into um, a bit wow. of hers. Yeah. So that was yeah, that, that was, was something we got very excited about every time we, we heard Minnesota. So that was great. Um, but again, you know, check out ZimmermanStan.com uh, for, for just, a, a like I said, a wonderful website, Stan. And I can't thank you enough for joining me tonight. I, it's, it's a very, it's a big honor for me to have you on. So I really appreciate that. Well, thank you for asking me and uh, look forward to staying in touch with you. Absolutely. And, and uh, stay safe during COVID and we can't wait to see what you have coming up. Okay. Thanks. Thank you, Stan. <laughs>